Professor Byron Reeves is the Palsy Edwards Professor of Communication and uh, has for many years been a fellow of the International Communication Association, acknowledged for the significant contributions over time that he and his research have made to the theory of communications and to the way that that theory has supported uh, asking research uh, questions and implementing those questions. Well, I think it's particularly interesting that his title tonight is Feedback, Quick and Lots of It, and the End of Theory. Uh, the ubiquitous feedback that we have in uh, wearable devices, in mobile and stationary sensors, is providing new opportunities for research. Is there a theoretical basis to that? Uh, Byron's a good person to talk to with this because his uh, research for a number of years has been the basis of uh, media products for companies like uh, Microsoft, IBM, Hewlett Packard. And he has also done extensive studies on the importance of games, gamifying, the narrative, the story, and engagement in uh, human computer interactions. So, Byron, thank you. Uh, I have colleagues in uh, media studies who are doing work on good scholarship, on feedback in media, in every one of these time domains. <laughs> Writing books, doing experiments. And what I want to think about, or what I have been thinking about a little is, as I and a lot of the field have been moving toward the right on these time domains, ever smaller, <clears throat> ever more plentiful time domains, how does that change ideas about feedback, ideas about theory, things that we can say about, uh, about design. So this is the continuum, and uh, I'm going to jump a little bit into the milliseconds here. So this is a recent data set that we've collected. We've been collecting uh, data like this uh, over the last uh, couple of years at here at Stanford mostly, and you'll see why in a bit. This is logging of individual student laptops over the course of days, almost up to a week. And it's being displayed on a big uh, high definition uh, immersive visual environment. But these are screenshots every five seconds for what people are doing on their laptops. And we sit and ponder, we statistically dive in and try to uh, fish for interesting things to say mathematically about the series of images. But we've also been having a great time just walking around these data and pointing out different aspects of what's going on in the series. You know, what kind of feedback are these people getting? What are their motivations? What are they doing? And so lots of pretty interesting things to say about this data <clears throat> even before we start thinking about theorizing about exactly why uh, it may change the way it does. Here's one thing to say about the data. On average, the modal response, or, or the median response rather, of a switch going from one stream or task to another stream or task is 19 seconds. So I'm at home, I'm on my laptop, my laptop does everything, I'm a sophomore at Stanford, I only own two screens, I've got my laptop and my phone. So my laptop is Facebook, PowerPoint, uh, uh, buy a t-shirt, watch a movie, watch TV, whatever. It's everything on a single screen. So all the multitasking or the switching is done in the z-axis. I don't have multiple screens out in front of me, I'm going into screens that are, that are windows that are potentially behind the ones I'm looking at. So this is what I'm seeing. So I'm switching quite often. There's a long tail out on the other end. Very little time am I using two windows, which might be a, uh, an advantage if I'm coding. Occasionally people are using two screens or two windows, but most of the use of the computers are two windows. 75% of these task, uh, tasks are done less than a minute. There is some, you can see some, uh, this is a big entertainment section right here, this kind of darkened uh, uh, series right there. So there's, I'm watching a television show, but I'm also buying a t-shirt 
in the middle of that show because everything has a play button and a pause button. Everything I do in media, everything I'm going to get feedback about or give feedback to has a pause button and a play button, so I'm in control. This is a really interesting thing to say about uh, what's happening right now, I think, as people watch environments like this. This is not passive viewing where the fluorescent light of the television is just washing over me and uh, come what may of my response. This is an active uh, choice that I'm making in my media environment, giving feedback to someone or uh, taking it myself as a result of this change. But it's a really different way to mix up uh, media, to really get down into some small time units. So what's driving this, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the time scale of the theorizing about what's driving this, but one thing that's driving this is the sheer availability of technology uh, to look at, to go to the right on that time scale. Uh, that's what's driving this change uh, to smaller units here. We've got media consolidation on screens. So this is not everybody's home, and we still, I still have a home theater in my house, and I even still make an appointment with family members to actually sit down and watch a program that lasts 30 minutes, uh, and maybe even one that's broadcast, especially if it's sports. But a lot of consolidation on single screens, a lot of sensors potentially in the environment, and not just, uh, uh, well this is not news to anybody in this uh, audience, I'm sure, but sensors of different sorts that allow for all kinds of feedback from the user about what's going on. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, physiological sensors. There's all kinds of motion sensors, and we've already looked at sensors that actually uh, catalog what kinds of uh, screens are up there, but sensors that allow in the wild for me to wear a watch-like device or some other electrode, maybe a patch on my abdomen, that is transmitting information about physical responses that are related to important things like emotional response, attentional response, moment by moment, second by second. So uh, what we're looking at, so here's a, uh, the Empatica uh, uh, sensor that we're using to look at heart rate and uh, skin conductance responses that happen in seconds, that change in seconds and change in me meaningful ways. So that uh, data that I just, that screen data that I just showed you, this is the physical data for 12 people for one day of those screens every five seconds. And the red and black are just, the red is when people are in front of their screens, the black is for, is our, the skin conductance response for uh, times during the day when I'm not in front of my screen. But this skin conductance response is an automatic, autonomic, involuntary response to novel stimuli, to change in the environment, to, uh, that indicates interest. It just indicates the system is awake and ready to process. Not good or bad necessarily, but, uh, but something interesting is going on. So this has radically changed the time domain in which we're thinking, or the theory units that we're actually uh, uh, thinking about here. So I mean, I'll, I'll give you a um, a little bit of a literature review to show how this happened. So one, I've been interested in emotional responses to media for a long time. Uh, when we were taking diary responses or using subjective responses or maybe beeping or calling somebody to say, how are you feeling this afternoon on different emotion scales and what are you doing in your media environment, we were looking at mood management theory that actually trans uh, that, that uh, came about over the course of hours and probably today. I'm really depressed today. I need to watch some comedy. Or I need to do something this hour that counters or, or uh, uh, accents what the feelings that I have. But these momentary arousal spikes are a totally different theory about something that happens mostly involuntary, uh, a response that happens in very, very quick time to me. So the progress to the right or the movement to the right in that time scale has really changed a lot of the theorizing about how, to, how people give feedback to what they're, what they're looking at. 
And here's, a, here's some more about, uh, about that theory. So it, this is not a, a, a theory about the, the afternoon. This time scale right here is just a couple seconds before and after this line right here, which is where the switches occur. So when I go from watching the situation comedy to um, uh, buying the t-shirt or a quick uh, exit from uh, my uh, Word document, the paper I'm writing for my professor to check uh, Mary Beth's Facebook uh, page to see if there are any updates, whatever. Uh, this is stuff that's happened. This is what's this switch that's happening right here. One of the interesting things that we found when we went into this time domain, usually we think about this arousal response as something the media does, something changes up there, and bam, I get hit with it. Uh, my body responds, I have an involuntary response, I show a physical signature of that response. But one of the things that we found here is that active viewing is the arousal is actually occurring before the switch occurs. So it's more like, the story is more, I'm writing my paper, I'm almost done with the first paragraph, I've got one more sentence, then I'm going to Mary Beth's uh, uh, Facebook page. That's gonna be exciting, and the arousal is increasing right here until that switch occurs, and it, it really doesn't increase uh, after that. So this is, um, hundreds of thousands of time points that actually happen in that. So let me talk about a little, <clears throat> uh, so this is just changing the theory. When you, when you change the time scale, you change the theory. And if I went and talked with a colleague who was looking at mood management in the course of hours or afternoons or days, I might be talking about something radically different. And this is one of the, the points to make as we think about data and feedback systems that involve all this sensing when we ex try to explain what's happening, move the time units, and you may have radically moved the theory. Okay, so time units also focus research on individual variants over time. And this is uh, uh, some, some I, I wanna talk a little bit about um, how we invest in research. And some of this comes from my colleagues at the Center for Advanced Study of Behavioral Sciences last year who spent some time thinking about this. When it comes time for me to do a study, you know, I've got a bunch of people, I've got a bunch of variables, maybe I've got a bunch of occasions or a bunch of time, and generally in my field, in social science, I'd say in psychology, political science um, as well, uh, we're really focused on spending a lot of money on getting a great group of people. Good random sample, don't get 10, you don't have enough power to do statistics, you know, get 1,000, all the, the, the concern about people without much of an investment in process, without a, much of an ability to invest in process because time units of afternoons are hard to come by, whereas time units of seconds might be uh, substantially easier to come by. So these data might be a lot easier uh, to, to, to get to. This was part of this project, and I'm, I'm trying to be provocative here in like 12 or 15 minutes here. This was part of a project that I did with Nilam Ram, and we were trying to think of a, he did this, he, this is his slide, where he was trying to think of a way to show what this investment in a occasions or time units could make to research. In fact, we were all saying to each other, uh, probably more forcefully than I'm even saying now, relax on, pe on this people thing. Relax on, I need a thousand people, a hundred people to do my study. What I need is a million time points for you. And then I'll do my modeling, I'll do my math, I'll do my theory, and then I'll move to the, move to the next person right here. So these are pictures of uh, the hands for people that were in one of the long run. He's at Pennsylvania State University. He's a mathematical psychologist. Uh, he, had, he took pictures of people's hands. Quit averaging people over single points in time. You're throwing away too much data. So these are all the details that you can see of age and gender and occupation and just lots of nuance. And this is the exact arithmetic average of the, all the photographs. And you can't really, you can see it's a hand, it's five fingers, but you can't see all the nuance. So I just thought I'd put that in. I thought it was a nice provocative way to make that point that that investment in that cube, start investing in time points, especially as they get smaller. So time units also change intervention opportunities. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a slide uh, also 
uh, from the line where we were together he, talking about what happened when you collected studies. This, these are all self-reports of emotional experience in different, in different time units. You know, how do you feel today? How's it uh, going this hour, or the last month, whatever. And looking at reviews of work that actually intervened at different, at different places. The smaller the time units, uh, the more individualized the data, the better the in interventions uh, seem to be. That's uh, uh, from, from that literature. I, I thought I'd put this up here as well. This is a feedback um, study that, um, that we were working on. It's not in the, in the context of physiological recording, but it's really pretty interesting with respect to the individual over time. So I'm at work. I need to do better at work. I need to learn some things. I need to apply those lessons on the sales floor. This is a big box electronics retail. This is my store. I'm a, an employee. I get my own store uh, to train on, to, to simulate, to kind of nurture as I work. And this is all hooked into the point of sale system and, and information about how my work is going uh, as I'm doing that work. And then in the background, as I'm completing that work, I'm being reinforced or redirected or acknowledged or given points or whatever in a time domain that exactly matches uh, the, the, the time domain of the work. And th the point here is that when you think about matching that, I mean, for example, the, the uh, classic li or literature in classical conditioning has always been uh, tempting for people in media to think a lot about, but we've never had the time domain in which to actually apply that work. So this is uh, behind the scenes. Let's change uh, what's happening in this animated game uh, in relation to the to the input that that person is, is giving. So it's feedback that actually matches that. You get really good change that wouldn't happen in a longer time domain. And then I'm going to end with uh, um, the provocative part of the title here. So in this. Uh, Center for Advanced Study of the Behavioral Sciences group that was thinking about this, we were actually thinking about it in the context of people in science who were really talking about how having a lot of information about short responses changes the value of theory in research. Now this is uh, uh, fighting words <laughs> uh, in the university. Uh, the, the, the kind of the real polka in this, in this came not for me, but uh, this notion of the end of theory. This is the Wired Magazine graphic that uh, had the article about the end of theory. But when you've got enough data, powerful enough computers can analyze the data quickly, theorizing about the right starting point is not as important. We value theory because we need to efficiently begin in a place that we think about because if we be began at random, we'd probably begin in the wrong place. But in this inductive deductive cycle, the feedback both of research as, as well as the things that we're studying right here can get going so fast that the starting point is not quite as important. I won't say it is unimportant, but it's not quite as important. So in, in typical research, we have an idea, you know, we do, uh, or maybe formalize that idea, deduce from that idea, do an experiment, and then repair the idea. And that cycle might take years, maybe even decades. But in the new media environment, the ones that I was showing you, the feedback can actually occur fast enough that you get this uh, uh, inductive, deductive cycle spinning extremely quickly. This is a lot of the design folks talk about this in terms of artistic execution uh, as well. But uh, being able to iterate quickly is really a major advantage. So that's the, the last uh, kind of provocation I'll make with respect to these small, uh, small time units. And happy to have any comments or, or questions as well.